Barrel nuts, alternatives to reloading and getting the most out of your factory stock. This week on Mail Call Mondays. Mail Call Mondays is brought to you by Modular Driven Technologies. If you need a chassis system for your precision rifle, check out mdttac.com. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Welcome to another Mail Call on Mondays, and this Monday, our first question comes from Jeffrey. And Jeffrey asks, can you use a barrel nut system on any custom action? There are some out there like the Deadline and Mousing Field, which I know were designed to utilize barrel nuts, making it very user-friendly to swap the barrels instead of going to a gunsmith. But something like a Defiance or Surgeon don't seem to be. Also, what other features do you look for in custom actions that would sway your decision in one over another? Thanks for doing what you do with MCM and review videos. Uh, well, Jeffrey, there are quite a few actions out there that will utilize a barrel nut in order to allow you to headspace the barrels at home and be able to have a little bit easier time rebarreling that action. Uh, both the Defiance and Surgeon seem to be able to utilize that uh, depending upon what kind of chassis systems you put them in, etc. Uh, pretty much uh, any thread in barrel type system uh, should be able to be configured for a barrel nut. It's just going to be if you can get something that's on the shelf, uh, like a Remage system or a Savage uh, barrel nut to be able to utilize, or if it's going to be something that you're going to have to have a gunsmith custom thread. Now, if you get into that area where uh, you're going to have to have something custom made, you might as well just have the gunsmith uh, thread the barrel traditionally and install it and chamber it for you. Uh, but in uh, most receivers out there that will utilize uh, Remington standard thread patterns, uh, you can utilize something like a Remage barrel, assuming that the breech base is the same. Uh, if the breech is different, like for instance the original uh, Ultimatum U300 action, while the threads were the same as a regular Remington 700 barrel, uh, the breech face was different than a 700, so you wouldn't be able to just screw a regular 700 barrel on. But specifically, uh, talking about the Defiance and Surgeon, there are guys out there that have utilized um, Remage barrel systems uh, on the Defiance and on the Surgeon. Uh, so it just depends upon the individual action uh, if that's going to work for you. And it's the limiting factors are really going to be things like uh, you want to make sure that there's a front face on the receiver that is going to allow that barrel nut to butt up to. And also, uh, like on our deadline here, we have this uh, top rail. You want to make sure that that rail is going to clear a barrel nut. Uh, if it's too low or too closely contoured to the barrel, uh, then you may have problems with that. And then finally, you're also going to want to take that into consideration uh, when you look at what chassis system you're going to put your barrel to action into. Uh, some chassis systems may cause problems with that. Uh, some stocks may need to be inleted for the barrel or for the barrel nut. Uh, so just little things to keep in mind. Uh, but outside of the Defiance and Surgeon, if you're coming across something else, um, I'm not quite sure on the big horns, although I don't see why they wouldn't be able to, uh, just call the action manufacturer and say, hey, I'm looking at this specific action, this is what I want to do with it, and they should be happy to help you out there. And our next question comes from Alan, and Alan asks, for those of us unfortunate enough to live in a country that does not allow reloading, are there things we can do to get the most out of factory ammunition? Uh, well, Alan, there are definitely some things you can do. First of all, uh, selecting the appropriate factory ammunition for your rifle is going to be key. Uh, now, you can take the twist rate on your rifle, and you can go through, and there are things like Berger has a, a calculator on their website that allow you to determine what bullets are going to be stable uh, in that barrel. So you'll need to decide on bullet weight there. And there is, of course, a range of bullet weights. Uh, so take that into consideration and then go down to the local store and find out what ammunition you can get in those different bullet weights and get a couple of boxes of each from different manufacturers and then you're just going to take those out and you're going to shoot them through the rifle and you're just going to do grouping tests uh, try to do the grouping tests on the same day that way uh, you're comparing uh, same environmental factors 
and get an idea of what uh, works best in that rifle. And then that's going to be about it. I wouldn't really recommend doing anything with uh, cartridge comparators or uh, measuring the length, overall length and that kind of thing. Uh, because really, I don't think that in uh, tactical rifle shooting or field rifle shooting, that's going to be a big deal. It may be if you were doing uh, bench rest type shooting and you're really working with a very, very specific jump uh, to the lands, but uh, overall, I think that the factory loaded ammunition is going to be close enough. You're not going to have to worry about running comparators on each one. Uh, now, I won't get into disassembling the ammunition, weighing the charges, and then reassembling it to make sure that the charge weights are equivalent because I don't know if that's legal in Allen's country. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, you can get into uh, some safety issues. Uh, so I would be very careful if you're trying to take ammo apart, pull it down, uh, weigh the charges and then reassemble it because uh, you could run into some problems there. I would also imagine that the equipment that you need to do that uh, may also be something that uh, they frown upon in countries where reloading is illegal. Uh, so that's about what you're going to be limited to. Just checking the readily available ammunition that you have, uh, testing a variety of it, and I would test at least one to two boxes of it. I would venture more along the lines of two boxes. And then even if you have the ability and you maybe settle in on one that is promising, uh, see if there's any way that you can get boxes from different lots and test those to make sure that you're getting consistency and not just a one shot, hey, this lot was really accurate in the rifle and that's going to go south next time. Uh, so those are just a couple of options, uh, but uh, really beyond that, there's not a lot you're going to be able to do to the actual ammunition itself uh, to improve the accuracy. It's just a matter of finding that accurate load. Now our next question comes from Matthew, and Matthew asks, other than changing out the stock on a factory rifle, what should someone on a budget do to get better accuracy out of a rifle? Uh, well, Matthew, the first thing is going to be to make sure that all your action screws and all the screws, all the fasteners on the rifle are appropriately torqued. Uh, you can either find that in your owner's manual or you can probably find it online or worse comes to worst, contact the manufacturer for the appropriate torque. Uh, but making sure that those action screws are torqued properly and then draw a witness mark across them. So take a silver sharpie or something and draw a line across them so you can tell if they start to move. Uh, that will head you a long way towards getting the best accuracy out of your rifle. Plus, later on, if you decide to disassemble it, to clean it, etc., put it back together and torque back to those specs, you will be very, very close on your zero. You may have to make a slight adjustment, but you'll be there. Uh, so it's a nice thing for later on. Uh, beyond that, uh, then you will want to check to see... Uh, what your free float is to make sure that your barrel is fully free floated from the lug forward to the tip of the stock. Now there's a catch here because some stocks, if you have a wood or a fiberglass stock uh, and you don't have it fully free floated, you may be able to go through and you may be able to sand out some portions in that stock and regain free float. And when I talk about free float, you should be able to take a sheet or two of paper and slide them down your barrel and get all the way from the front of the barrel to the recoil lug without dragging on the inside of the stock. Um, you should be able to, on most stocks, relieve any areas in there that are touching your barrel, and that will allow your barrel to vibrate uh, at its natural harmonic frequency. You won't get any uh, vibrations off of something uh, that could cause your bullets to impact uh, inconsistently. Now, I say there's a catch because if you look at stocks like the Remington 700 SPS, they come with this plastic stock on them. The stock actually has two pads at the front of the barrel that touch the barrel. Uh, these are pressure pads and they're there for a purpose. Uh, Remington decided that those pads pushing up on the barrel at that point with the stock properly torqued is more consistent uh, than that hollow less than rigid forearm uh, just kind of making contact wherever it wants to be. Now you can go in and grind those pads out. Uh, the same thing is true for the Hogue stocks that come on the SPS rifles. Uh, you can go in and try to grind that stuff out. But what will generally happen is when you grind those pads out, the stock will just curl up and it'll touch in some other place. 
so for those, you might have to actually remove the stock, uh, do some fiberglass inlay. Uh, I've heard of guys that are taking carbon uh, arrow shafts and actually inlitting those into the fore end of the stock and then epoxying them in and getting a little bit more rigidity in there and then being able to free float the stock from there. Uh, so those are some options, but if you're not willing to go that distance and you do have pressure pads at the front of your stock, I would be very hesitant to remove those because if you remove them, uh, now the stock may touch in other places. And when you remove that material, it may touch in other places. It's just this ongoing process where the stock just keeps curling up uh, to touch the rifle in places you don't want it to. So keep those kind of things in mind. Um, also, you may find that depending upon what stock you have, uh, you may not be able to really load your bipod. If you're shooting with a bipod on that stock and it is a fairly flexible stock and it has pressure pads, well then the, when the rifle is just sitting on its bipod, just relaxed, there's a certain amount of pressure up on that forend. Uh, when you shoot the rifle at that point, you're applying a certain amount of stress to the barrel and the bullets are going down range and hitting at a certain point of impact. If you take those feet of that bipod now and you hook it into something and you drive the rifle forward like we very often do in precision rifle shooting, uh, now you're pulling down on that forend, you're reducing the amount of pressure that barrel pad has pushing up on the bottom of the barrel and it's probably going to change your impact. Uh, so go out and do a little experimenting with that and see if you get a point of impact change and that will tell you, okay, you're putting too much pressure on the bipod or not enough. Uh, but beyond that, there's not a whole lot more you can do and I hesitate to tell people to do a lot with their factory stocks uh, because you're putting a lot of time and effort into that thing where maybe if you just save a little bit of money instead of buying epoxy and buying aero shafts and buying all this stuff uh, then you could get into a better stock quicker uh, but that of course is a decision for you to make uh, some of us value our time at certain levels. Other people look at it as it's a hobby. I enjoy tinkering with things, and so they may not see it that way. And if that's the case, uh, tinker with your stock all you want until you get shooting the way you want. Uh, but definitely consider just putting some money aside for an upgrade uh, if you see an upgrade in your future. Our next question comes from Austin, and Austin asks, I'm running an internal box magazine and still want to shoot competitions. What are some suggestions, knowing clearing a stage will be very difficult, on how to make it as efficient as possible? Uh, well, Austin, your gun handling is really, really going to be important at that point. Uh, if you're running a box magazine where you're limited to four or five cartridges, uh, most stages in uh, PRS and uh, other competitions like that are running up to 10 cartridges. So you know you're going to have to reload. Um, depending upon the stage, you may be able to get away with just putting your ammunition in a ball hack sitting next to the rifle and then loading out of your cap. Uh, or you may have to go to something like uh, one of the elastic round holders uh, that will allow you to insert cartridges in it and stick that or Velcro that to the side of your rifle. Um, short action precision makes two round holders. You could take three of the two round holders and you could Velcro them at an angle uh, just below your ejection port and that will allow you when you fire that last shot, leave the action open, pull one of those off, throw it in, close the action and fire. So you're going to end up uh, firing the magazine loaded cartridges for four or five and then single loading after that. Now, I will tell you that I have found that it is a better option on most stages if you're running a limited uh, capacity rifle like that to single load after you empty the magazine versus taking the time to refill the magazine and continue. Uh, the reason I say that is because if you are not really, really keen on your time management, then you can spend a lot of time loading the magazine and then only get one shot out of that loaded magazine when maybe you could have gotten three or four shots single loading before you ran out of time. Uh, so those are things to keep in mind. You will definitely want to practice single loading the rifle and single loading the rifle while you are still on the gun looking through the scope. Uh, if you get into the point where you're breaking position and rolling the gun over to load or to look inside, uh, that's going to be a bad thing. You're going to lose a lot of time there. Uh, but if you're on the gun and you fire and you're able to pull single load off the side, 
um, you're going to be able to save a lot of time and you're at least going to be able to go out and have a lot of fun. I can't say you're going to be super competitive, especially if there are uh, really time limited stages, uh, but you're definitely going to have some fun and enjoy it. Uh, but I would definitely look at some way to attach ammunition to the side of the rifle. Uh, there are arm cuffs that you can get. There are buttstock cuffs. Um, those I find to be a little bit slower than if I just have cartridges on the side of the rifle. Because on the side of the rifle, you're minimizing the movement. You're just pulling them out and going right into the ejection port. Uh, instead of if you're on an arm cuff, your arm may be underneath you here. Your arm may be out on a barricade. You're going to have to reach under around the rifle to grab the ammunition and throw it in. Uh, if you are working with... Uh, cartridge loops on your buttstock. Again, depending upon your position, it may not be too bad to come back and pull them off of a stock pack and throw them in. Uh, but in some situations, especially say you switch to the support side, now you're going to have to move your face and get underneath there and do all that stuff. Uh, so sticking cartridge loops underneath the ejection port of your rifle, either if they're uh, short action precision two round holders or uh, some homemade thing, uh, those are going to be your best bet, I think, uh, for running a top loader uh, internal box magazine in a competition environment. And our last question comes from Nanda. Nanda asks, how is your tricked Glock 19? Any issues? Well, I assume that you are referring to our uh, Danger Close Armament modified Glock 19 here. This is their signature series package, which overall has been a really, really great gun for me. Uh, now, we did go ahead and put Ameriglo suppressor sights on it and the RMR. Uh, this started out life as a Glock 19 MOS, so it was already milled for the MOS plates, uh, so it's just a matter of dropping the uh, RMR in there. Uh, now, if you decide to go this route and you're just your regular guy and you want to be able to carry this gun, I would recommend going with a regular Glock 19 and having Danger Close go ahead and do the RMR milling for you. Uh, the RMR will sit a little bit deeper in the slide and it will be more secure. You have fewer fasteners holding the sight on. I went with the MOS because I want the ability to be able to swap to different optics at different points later on down the road. Uh, but the RMR has worked out really great for us, and the machine work and the finish that Danger Close Armament put on this is great. Uh, this has got quite a few thousand rounds through it now. Uh, I took it down to the NRA uh, Law Enforcement Handgun Instructor course and ran it for the whole week down there. It ran absolutely flawlessly. I didn't have any problems with it at all. Uh, it does still have a stock Glock barrel in it. I believe Danger Close is offering their own barrels now. Uh, we may try to get one of those in at a later date so that, you know, everything matches on the gun. Uh, but overall, it's a really, really nice setup. Uh, we had them uh, do their signature slide package on it, so we do have cocking serrations on the front and back, and I really do like the front cocking serrations. They're nice and aggressive. Uh, no problems getting up in here and press checking on the gun. Uh, they also did their top cocking serrations. Um, I'm not a huge fan of top cocking serrations. I can take them or leave them. I wouldn't spend more money for them because I just find that uh, coming up with my thumb to do a press check here uh, is not the greatest thing in the world. And I have an optic back here, so if I need something to rack the slide off of, I can rack it off of the optic. Uh, so the top serrations, they are clean. They're very uh, aesthetically pleasing. Uh, they also did 45 degree cuts uh, down the top of the slide. And... Overall, I, I'm incredibly pleased with this. Now, uh, we did originally have this done just with the stock Glock trigger. trigger. It has an Overwatch trigger in it right now. Uh, the Overwatch trigger, I'm planning on doing a little bit of a review later on on it. Uh, but this is my carry gun. The Overwatch trigger is in there, so you can bet it's worked pretty well. Uh, we also have an Enforce APLC on here. And the APLC is just an absolutely perfect light. Uh, for this kind of package. You can see it doesn't stick out beyond the muzzle. It doesn't stick out uh, much at all on either side of the slide. Uh, it's just a really, really solid package for an everyday carry gun. 
And that is all for this episode of Mail Call Mondays. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. If you have any questions or comments over anything that we've covered, leave them in the comment section below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you're listening to us on your favorite podcast app, you can leave questions for us at 8541tactical at gmail.com. If you like the video, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, get out and shoot.